Hello, my name is Frank Hardman. I'm Professor of Education and International Development at the University of York in the UK. I've been researching teacher education for over 25 years in both high and low income countries. My work in low income countries has taken me to East and Southern Africa, West Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. In my talk, Placing pedagogy at the centre of teacher education reform. I would like to talk about how we can improve learning for all children through teacher education reforms. And my main argument will be that training teachers in an effective pedagogy, informed by observations of how they teach and how pupils learn, will be central to raising achievement. I'd like to put forward four propositions. Education quality is largely obtained through pedagogical processes in the classroom. Secondly, I'd like to argue that student achievement is heavily influenced by the knowledge, skills, dispositions and commitments of teachers in whose care students are entrusted. Thirdly, I'd like to argue that teacher education reforms need to focus on improving the pedagogical practices of teachers in the classroom. And finally, I'd like to argue developing the capacity of teacher educators so as to bridge the theory practice divide will also be key to such reforms. I'd like to define what I mean by pedagogy. I see pedagogy as being made up of both the observable act of teaching and its attendant discourses, how teachers talk about their teaching. So it's concerned with what teachers actually think, do and say in the classroom and how the act of teaching links with the social, the cultural and the political context in which teachers operate. International research into effective teaching tells us that the, fo the following behaviours are key to improving pedagogy. Teachers need to be very clear in their lesson outcomes, what the children will learn, so lesson clarity. They need to build into their lesson plans instructional variety, whole class group based and one to one activities. They need to incorporate and use people ideas in the classroom discourse itself. So this means they need to have appropriate and very questioning techniques that get beyond the simple closed questions or cue elicitations that I'll come back to later. They also need to probe for knowledge. They need to probe students' answers, ask the same student to come back and explain their thinking. And they need to give frequent feedback on how the students are doing, both in written and spoken comments. And finally, they need to ensure that there's a high level of student engagement throughout the lesson. Now, I would take, for example, the issue of classroom talk. We know from the international research there are five main kinds of talk. Uh, the most familiar would be the, the rote, the drills, the facts and the routines, where children often chorusing answers. We often see teachers lecturing through exposition. We see them often asking closed questions, questions that are to re test recall and memorization. We also see in issuing instructions on what to do next. And in some classrooms, we see teachers actually promoting discussion, open views uh, of ideas, exploring issues, and inviting the, the students to contribute their own ideas. And finally, we see dialogue. This is where teachers, through open questions and probing a student's answers, are asking for elaboration on the thinking that lies behind the answers that the students have given. And we also see in, in a dialogic classroom more student initiated questions and responses and more student to student interaction. Now, of these, I, research tells us that the, the first four are used most often and least often are the discussion and the dialogue. So these are key skills that teachers need to learn if they're going to broaden the repertoire of classroom talk. Now, the research that's been conducted into pre-service in many low-income countries that I've been researching shows that it's often of poor quality. And the research I've done into teacher colleges suggests it's largely lecture-based. And we often see lecturers in the colleges 
simply lecturing the students on how to do group work or how to carry out practical work in science. There's very little hands-on experience for the students. Similarly, in in-service education and training, in many of the countries that we've researched, it's also judged to be of poor quality with little transferability to the classroom. And where it does exist, it's often found to be ad hoc with very little follow-up in the classroom and it's mainly concentrated in urban areas. So this means that in terms of the quality of education that the students are receiving, the teachers are often using transmission of knowledge and rote learning in terms of pedagogy. And such a na narrow pedagogical approach is not supporting what we now call the soft skills, the critical thinking, the conceptual learning, or the problem solving and team skills that 21st society needs. So, this is leading us to conclude that we need system level reforms. And indeed, many countries have started to overhaul their teacher education systems, moving away from a largely college based provision to a more long term sustainable vision of continued professional development. And this systematically updates the key competences that teachers require in the classroom. If we look at Leon Tittle's overview of good quality education from the University of Bristol, you will see that he's got these three major domains. Now today, I'm focusing very much on the bottom left domain, the enabling school environment. And you'll see there that school-based teacher development, school self-evaluation, and structured and inclusive pedagogy are absolutely key to good quality education. So, in line with the international research that I briefly outlined, the emphasis then should be to bring together pre-service and in-service to ensure that there's coherence, consistency, and quality of training. And in response to this, many systems have set up a decentralized network of provision at the regional, the district, and the zonal or sub-district level so in order to monitor and support school-based programs. So what we're seeing is many systems moving towards school-based models of teacher education that build partnerships between higher education and the schools in order to blend the theory and the practice. And they also bring in external support advisors using the form of mentors and other kinds of teacher educators, inspectors, and so on. Such school-based models then provide the opportunity for teachers to work together with other colleagues on issues of instructional planning, through the creation of study groups in the schools, through the mentoring, both internal mentoring, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, and also external support coming in, peer coaching, conducting action research together to collectively guide curriculum assessment and professional learning decisions in the school. And you see in my diagram there then, so these three main components. So the focus of these reforms is very much on, as I said at the beginning, developing the pedagogical content knowledge and skills of teachers to include those effective teaching behaviours. There's been a shift to decentralise the focus from top down to bottom up and top down approaches. And there's been very much a shift towards school cluster focus. So schools coming together in clusters being given distance learning materials, training modules, receiving external support from college tutors, inspectors, and other external experts coming into the schools, and obviously the use of ICT. Now, what are the emerging lessons? Well, from the research, we know that a multi-mode system, including distance learning, and teach developments at the school and cluster level, appears to me the most cost-effective way of ensuring national CPD coverage. We also need to build in incentives to bring in uh, the, the commitments of teachers to, to develop the, the commitments of teachers. So that in turn will develop their capacity so that those who are the most effective start to take on the most responsibility for delivering school-based continuing professional development. We also know from research that there needs to be clear divisions of roles and responsibilities between the national, the regional and the district offices, and indeed between 
the head teachers, the schools, and the teacher educators. So the partnerships need to be developed. We also know that teachers need to be given release time to engage in school-based continuing professional activities. And indeed, the recent research is suggesting that teachers need a minimum of 50 hours per year to engage in this kind of continuing professional development. Anything between 50 and 100 is, is proves to be effective. Anything below that uh, has, has shown very small effect sizes. Teacher education reforms also need to be aligned with the curriculum and assessment reforms at, at a national scale. Going back to Leon Tickley's diagram, obviously you need a systemic approach that brings in the national, the regional, the district and the community, as well as the school level. But these reforms also need to be in line with reforms to the curriculum and to the assessment processes within the system. Often they're done piecemeal rather than in a, in a joined up way. And teacher education and professional learning at the school and cluster level will obviously require an investment of time and money in building the partnerships and the collaborations and the delegations. So it's not necessarily a quick fix. I would argue though, that there needs to be a better balance between the time and the money spent on the pre-service and the continued professional development. And indeed, in the long term, I would argue, the medium to the long term, I would argue that it's probably make sense to start to shorten the pre-service in favour of more school-based teaching, uh, teacher training, thereby directing more of the training resources towards the schools and towards the teachers actually in the classroom, because here is where the research tells us it will make a difference, rather than in the lecture theatres, as has traditionally been the case in college-based provision. So, to summarise what I've been saying then, um, the, the general shift has been towards school-based models of teacher education and development. And I'm arguing there really that in the medium to long term, we should be thinking about where we're going to put the resources. Should we be continuing with more traditional and more expensive college-based provision? Or indeed, should we maybe shorten the pre-service and put more emphasis on the in-service, on the continued professional awareness of teachers? Because here is where the research is telling us it will make a real difference. For example, in Tanzania, one of the recent projects, the evaluations we did, we found that uh, college-based provision was 10 times more expensive than school-based in-service. So that's then making the system question whether we should continue with uh, a three, two, three-year course, or maybe we should be thinking about a one-year course and then having a continuous professional development scheme put in place whereby the teachers in the schools are learning actually on the job and they can go back into the colleges for refresher courses for more of the principles and the theory and then go back into the schools so we we need to be a bit more creative about the, the kinds of provision and the flexibility of that provision and i think this is where a lot of systems are, are moving towards